get out and write this book. Tell us about the research journey. The, by the way, I, I, Josh will be selling books. He'll be signing books. Don't do it for him. Don't do it for us. Do it because you're going to want to read this book. It's fascinating. Right? Fill with research. Fill the solutions. Um, fill the stories. In so, fact, props to the conference on that note. I literally won't make a penny off of you buying the book because they bought the book so that they could get them like at two for a special rate. So definitely buy them your money goes to the conference. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you tell us about your journey in writing the book in terms of what you learned and unpacked. Because you came from your own personal journey and unpacked kind of the reality for parentally in our country. So yeah. share that. Yeah. So it was fascinating to me that when I announced legal action, um, so many groups supported me. And so I became fascinated. Why do so many, I mean, Cheryl Sandberg, was, her group was reaching out and raised right for all these, and men's groups too. And so I went on this journalistic journey to try to understand why so many people cared about my family's little story. And that's when I came to understand that we are all in this together. That everybody who really wants actual equality um, is fighting this fight. And this has been in the shadow, the male side of this has been taking place in the shadows. And with all these fathers across the country, it's so sad. They thought they were the only ones struggling. They didn't know, but so are all these other dads. And so I went looking for real studies about what's going on with fathers in this country. How they're suffering from work life conflict at least as much as, if not more, than women, according to one study. How men feel that they don't get to have a relationship they want with their children because they will be punished in the workplace if they take time off. And my book is filled with stories of men who did take time off, who were then punished for it. And there's a guy in the advertising industry, and he worked at a major firm, and he said they had two weeks paternity leave, but everyone knew you're not supposed to use it. That's why men don't take paternity leave in America. The overwhelming majority of the bit that's available is unused. So he, everyone knew you're not supposed to take it, so he took one week, but then he quit to work at a small firm where he felt that he could get great balance. He took like a $20,000 pay cut and he's happier, and that's the story of Mother Town. So actually, let me just validate that. Yeah. So Ernst and Young came out with a 2015 study about millennials, young people, and really yeah. old, where he breaks the data. And one of the, there were two really shocking things that came out of the study for me. One was that um, millennial fathers reported that within the last three years, I think it was something like 72% had changed jobs to get better work-life balance or better work-life integration. Fathers, so that is that secret story. We talk about mothers all day long, I'm all for that, but I really like us to really expand how we look at this whole conversation, not just parented to caregiving, so let's start there, and additionally, to making sure that we're having conversations so that men and fathers are improving this conversation, not as men ambassadors, but as equal participants, because they are equal caregivers. Yeah, and, and, and so the EWAT study found that men in this country are even more likely than women to switch jobs or careers, move to another state, even move to another country uh, to have more work-life balance. But the, the difference is, men, we're not telling our employers that that's why we're doing it. So all these great employers out there who would have been willing to work with these men um, it, it just lose them. And they think, though, this guy got a better job, whereas really he's going somewhere with a different culture. And about one in five men are taking career breaks, which gets the opt-out idea. Well, it's not as many as women, but this is what you're looking at. This whole idea, I mean, what you do in, in your upcoming book, which I love, is you, you, know, you talk about these women as trailblazers. And, and, that, and that's not usually how the media depicts those who opt out. So, um, you know, I too came from that journalistic mindset. It's like, what the heck is happening? Why is it that there's so few women talk? And we've got all the research about the culture, et cetera, but I knew there was something going on because they were opting out or leaving the work world in that mid-career point. And I wanted to understand why. I wanted to know what happened. And I wanted to understand what happened probably because it happened to me. And so um, here's what I learned. I did this, I interviewed 186 women and I surveyed 1,500 more. And what I learned was that, in fact, they, well, actually, here's the secret tip. You want to understand millennials? Go talk to an opt-out mom. Because guess what? They value um, relationships over uh, status or success, traditional stuff, career ladder success, and they value time over money. So when you're actually trying to cr create a culture that is inclusive of millennials, if you create a culture that's inclusive of mid-career mom, you know what, you really win. The on-ramp you back, and all of this is what's going on. And so anyways, back to the story. What I learned was these incredible women hadn't opted out. They may have downshifted for a period of time, taken off six months a year, maybe even three or four years, but they had actually then zigzagged and created this incredible career path, but they didn't talk about it. And many of them didn't even report in their LinkedIn profiles that they'd been actually out for a couple of years or downshifted. They hid them. So if you actually look at many successful women in this country, they, in fact, have 
have downshifted or paused, if you will, but we don't know it. So they're leaning into the full bloom of their lives, not just into their careers, and that's what the next generation needs to hear. That's where certain major advertising executive in London went um, just way off the rails when he claimed that you know they don't, there aren't a lot of women leaders in advertising because women don't want it because they want the to what way to give us. He took the first part of what you said, you know, that a lot of people are opting out, but he ignored the reality that many of them opt back in. It's worth pausing, and and also the fact that dads have the exact same struggle. That and they're doing it. all in this together. Well, they're and they're doing it right. They're they're, they're t making career choices and doing things, but they're not talking about it. So there's this authenticity, this bringing. What we were talking about. You guys were talking about bringing your authenticity to work. Well, yes, yes, women, you need to do that. But guess who really needs to do it? It's the guys. You know, they're speaking out and going to the baseball game and not telling anybody or whatever. And I work with companies now. This is part of what I do. I go into these companies. You know, so the, the stereotype, the, the idea of lean in, and Cheryl Sandberg, as you know, is in that book, and she says things she didn't say in. in but, but with, you know, the stereotype is that if there's a meeting in the workplace, the men are going to talk more, have more confidence, women need to lean in more. When I go to businesses, often they'll have me first do a big talk for like the entire staff or hundreds of people or thousands or whatever. And it's always women's hands that go shooting up and men are silent at first. It's the opposite of that stereotype. And that's because men are trained from so early on. Don't talk about gender. Because if you do, someone will say to you, oh, you man, who are you to talk about this? You're privileged. And, and, and I always tell them it's literally the exact opposite response. But as soon as I started speaking out about this, it's been nothing but love coming from this. So I work with companies now in which I have meetings exclusively with men at first. And then I start to expand it with a couple women observers who then say how oh, great it is and men feel safe. And then we expand it even further. So when you create these, these inclusive cultures in which men feel equally comfortable talking about these challenges, then it's inevitable that you're going to have policy and culture change. So one of the things we struggle with in our industry is we've got a lot of these lovely women's networks. And I actually love women's networks, so there's no criticism there. Um, but sometimes they become echo chambers. Anyone can relate to that? <laughs> yes. Love echo chambers. I love telling myself I'm wonderful. <laughs> but um, guess who's not included in those conversations? Men, right? So what I have this dream that may I have a dream that maybe we're going to get to a place where yes, we may have, still have women, women's leadership programs because we still need those, but that we actually have work-life integration networking programs that are actually across gender and you know having these conversations more authentically. I actually was in an advertising agency recently who is considered one of the best places to work for working moms and I was being with a dad there and he's completely beside himself because he's following his wife to Australia for her very successful medical career and he's going to pause and he doesn't know what it's going to mean for him. And for men, it can be almost significantly worse if they pause their career. So talk about that a little bit. Well, first of all, just individually because the pressure's on men. You know, it's interesting to hear the keynote you know, this morning, all this stuff about diamonds, all this stuff. You know, hey, uh, ultimately, uh, so if you want to diagnose a problem, I've learned this in journalism, always follow the money. Always follow the money. So the pressure on men to be here, to, to be uh, breadwinners is so extreme that from an extremely early age, when you're a little baby, a little boy, you start to understand that someday you're going to have to make money for your family. And that pressure doesn't go away. So a lot of men, when they're suddenly like not the, the breadwinners, or find themselves in this situation, um, they, they face not only like their own insecurities, but they can be ostracized by others, including women. Many women will look at a man on the playground on a, a work day and, and say, yo, what are, you, what are you doing here? Is he scary? Is he here to not? Even though he's right there with his own children. And this is because of how we're raised. So yeah, a lot of these men can really struggle. And um, you know, it, it gets back to this whole basic idea that what we really need to do is to eradicate these back from our kids of gender and understand that everyone's an individual and that gender equality is a real thing, that we actually are equally capable at home and at work, and that we should celebrate that. So the more we talk about that, the more houses like that will be able to, to find their strength. But this stigma exists in every culture in the world, including Australia. So, okay. yeah. um, so uh, let's, let's follow the money. So I've had uh, the absolute privilege of um, doing a benchmarking study. We're actually about halfway through the benchmarking study. We interviewed 20 agencies to ask them kind of the real truth about their policies and how does it really work, et cetera. And um, well, we don't, I, I hear this again and again, we can't really do that because we can't afford to do that. So let's talk just about affording um, paid leave in your office. Thank you. Let's talk about what paid leave, financially, why it makes sense to offer paid leave yeah, right let's do that. Okay, so here's the fact. All right, and remember, like I'm a fact checker guy, nonpartisan. I look at actual numbers. This is proven. First of all, what we need is a, a 
public program of paid family leave in America, which does not require businesses to pay one month. We have it in California, New Jersey, Rhode Island. New York recently passed the best one in the nation. You'll have it in 2018 here. And the way it works is an insurance program. People have this tiny little payroll deduction. That money goes into a plan. When you need a family leave for any reason, whether it's to care for a new child, uh, an elderly parent, a sick spouse, yourself after an illness, you get some pay out of that fund, and the business can pause paying you. All the numbers are in, profits are up, businesses are loving it, it's worth it. Because they're retaining time. employees. Because right now, people are dropping out of the workforce altogether, but when you have this policy in place, instead, people take time off and come back. And that's why, even though it shouldn't be law, in my opinion, it also is very, very good when businesses choose to offer paid leave that supplements a state program, or in most states, just exists on its own. Because what's happening now is, according to the best studies out there, replacing an employee can cost between 90 and 200 percent of annual salary. So to replace that person, you might have to pay twice an annual salary, whereas if you give them six weeks paid off, that is a tiny little drop in the bucket. It's proven to, to retain. And I think this is something you've looked into as well with millennial moms. This is something you can tell us about, about what it takes to attract and to retain them. So here was the thing that surprised me and sort of broke my heart. So there's a bunch of different studies around millennial women's attitudes towards pausing their career or work, you know, career immigration. And I was astounded that more than boomers, more than Gen X's, millennials report that they plan to pause, plenty of women report they plan to pause their career. I was really shocked by that. And it's not because I have a value judgment here. It's just, you know, in our world of lean in, what you're saying, you're going to pause your career? And the answers I got when I spoke to millennials for my book was, I don't have a choice. And here are the reasons they don't have choices. Women, as you probably know, are graduating six percent of call they're six percent of college graduates. All that school debt, guess who has it? It's mostly women. So then they go into the work world and they have a great job, etc., and then they get married, and that's awesome. Their husband's making more money, even if their job's great, not always, but sadly still most of the time. Then they hit that, okay, well, we had a baby, what do we do? Well, child care costs as much as a college year of tuition. That's what I've read now. Or, isn't that amazing? Well, it's helpful. I was just in San Francisco, and my friend told me that they're putting their kid in private kindergarten, and that costs at least $50,000 a year. Thank you. So if you've got school loans, you can't choose. Between, you have to choose between school loans and child care. So many of the young women I interviewed actually were forced to stay home and didn't want to. So I am nervous about our efforts to now us get more women leaders if we don't have systems and support in place to make this and then, you know, it all comes full circle as well because the average, I, I, we, during the break, we were showing a video and I can tweet it out later, but one of the big things I've reported on is false images of dads and moms in media. Dads as lazy dads. And, and how bad that is because it reinforces these backward messages that if you give a guy time off, he's really not going to use it to take, take care of his family. Give him a paternity leave, he's going to go home, pick up his feet, drink a beer, watch some sports game, wait till his wife comes home and really do all the work. So really keep men in the workplace to make sure they're productive. Let's let, let the women stay home. So, and then what happens is because of these systems right now, um, we're not getting adequate diverse thinking inside all sorts of places, including, extremely, uh, including the extremely influential advertising industry. So the more that we can tackle these structures, the more actual diversity and inclusion you have. And in advertising, we'll see it not just in the agencies, but in the products that those agencies put out. They'll be much less likely to do really false, bad ads, anti-dad ads. And I explain in the book, anti-dad stereotypes are anti-women. That's, that's how it works. It's, it's all one thing. It's the flip side of the same point. But you know, the more diversity and inclusion you achieve, and we're looking at gender here, so within gender, the better representations of both men and women you will see in advertising, which will then help tackle the stuff we heard about this morning, all these ridiculous over-sexualized ads, all these things, the more broad thinking you have, the better ads you create. So really, it's a double win for the advertising industry and then society at large. Well, and also now the brands are saying you can't have 50-50, by the way, that's a little yeah. pressure, isn't it? But, but, um, yeah, right. But, so just a quick raise your hands. How many of you offer paid uh, paternity leave at your agencies. How many have it? Nice! How many of you, be honest, how many of you don't fully know or understand what your policies even are at your company? That's okay. Like, I have probably more of you, but that's okay. Because uh, these things are written so obscurely. These are HR exactly. Oh, yeah. These you are HR exactly. Yeah. Hey, what are they HR exactly? Oh, these are HR exactly. I forgot. Okay, so it's you great guys. to see you guys have, a lot of you have paid parental, uh, paternity leave. Here's the next question. How many are you seeing? How many of you are seeing the men take the full paid parental leave? Some. That's great. That's great. That's great. Now the next question.
how many of the men come back expressing concerns that their careers will look like, might be derailed, or might not be supported? Are, they, are you having that issue? No? Yes? No? Yeah. How, okay, thank you. How yeah, long is your paid, paid paternity leave? Raise your hand if it's one week. What if it's two weeks? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what you see. And by the way, it, it, by law, like under federal guidance, it, I want to be clear here. It's not the same thing as giving women time for physical recovery. So what I was pushing for legally, and what I explained to the book, is that there absolutely should be physical recovery time. And under general like legal guidance, you have, as a rule, six weeks for women for physical recovery. It's caregiving leave has to be clearly distinguished as a separate form of leave that a company is giving, and that has to be gender neutral. So what a lot of companies do to cheat this system is they say, oh, we're going to give women 12 weeks of physical recovery leave. And any person of any gender, an extra one week of, of, of parental leave, um, that, that has been a way of keeping things in the past, keeping women at home. Uh, because by all the, the legal guidance, you don't need 12 full weeks just for physical recovery. So what we need to do is really stand up to these policies that are uh, putting out a pretense of being fair, but are actually tilted against women pushing them to say. So um, let's talk about, I know, the election. Um, it's a dream, you know, what is it? We're one of two countries in the world, Papua New Guinea is the other that doesn't offer paid maternity leave. How did that happen? Does anyone, do you guys know this? It's disgusting. How did that happen and what's going to happen with right. the election? So everybody complains about the fact that we are the only developed nation that doesn't have any paid maternity leave. And it's true, but no one is ever talking about why. And that's what I delved into for the book. It was like Eureka when I came to understand, of course we have no paid maternity leave because our structures were based on mad men. And the thinking is, she's a woman, who needs her money? The man is supposed to work and make the money. So what we end up having is, we are the only nation that does not make sure that a parent can be home and put food on the table for at least a block of weeks because of that decision, because of that false thinking about gender. So it's all about sexism and how that plays out in the election. Uh, Hillary Clinton is supporting what I'm supporting, which is you know, paid family leave as a national policy. Um, and Donald Trump put forward an unbelievably sexist, nonsensical policy. The, the, the numbers like literally don't add up, and it specifically includes fathers. So it's like even if he created it, it wouldn't help mom because the money that he said he would use isn't like physically literally there. But um, so yeah, he, he suggested a policy in which he credited Obama before that would help only mothers, and we're not doing anything for that. So uh, just by chance, let's say Hillary does pull a rabbit out of the hat by a couple years and does win, will she actually, in your opinion, and I just wonder about public, does it, we have a public policy, this is not an issue for everyone, it's going to be national, so you're not going to be struggling in your agencies to figure out how to create a fair league. You shouldn't have to. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have to. So, will she be able to get it through? Because uh, she claims this is going to be one of her first things, just yeah. like her husband did FMLA, which right. frankly helps fathers. Um, uh, will she uh, have the ability to get it through? So I spent time on Capitol Hill, yeah. meeting with even numbers of Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. Um, they, Democrats are lining up to support this. Actually, the, I'm on a working group now with uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand here in New York, and she's, she's uh, like one of the leading forces pushing this. The overwhelming majority of Republicans and independents also support a national paid family leave insurance program, like what I like what I described. Not a requirement on businesses to pay, but that little payroll deduction that that pays you. Um, but unfortunately, the lawmakers in Congress are not yeah, responding to the overwhelming majority of Republicans, and that has to do with gerrymandered districts and the way that you know no one needs to listen to the majority of their party anymore. Only the more extremes and extreme left does want it, but extreme right hears this and assumes it must be some evil tax. So what we need to do is push more Republicans to be where the majority of Republicans are in America on this issue, because there's broad bipartisan consensus. So will she be able to get it done? I don't think a lot of politicking, but I think I think within the next five years that we could actually see national politics. Um, I just want to make one little side comment. So when I was doing research for the book and I was you know looking at this issue. And I was comparing the United States versus other countries. Do you realize that ours is the only country of the top 50 countries in the world that has female workforce um, uh, stagnation over the last 25 years? We've been at 67% since 1994. Now Japan is at 74%, just to give you a comparison. I mean, and you know, the other countries, I think there's a couple of, um, Saudi Arabia might be behind us, but really, honestly, if you look at the top countries, we are shockingly behind. And I'm telling you, it's not because all the moms want to go home and take care of the 
for children. Not to be any judgment about that. I did that. I understand that. I have great reverence for that. What I'm saying is that we not need to figure out these policies. And sadly, I hope you're right that in the next five years we will have a public policy. But if we don't, it's on you, the HR experts and cheerleaders and champions uh, and visionaries to actually make that change. And, and you know, it has to be done right. And so one thing that I do with companies that help you design ones that, that work, that are proven to work really well. Yeah. And you, know, you mentioned Saudi Arabia, they actually have less opportunity. They actually have. It's, it's Saudi Arabia, <laughs> where women have to fight for the right to, to drive try. men and have some, at least some, like a tiny bit, but some guaranteed paternity. Like even Saudi Arabia recognizes that a man should at least be able to be there in the first couple of days. Um, and, and, and look, ultimately, what, what you described, and I'm seeing the, the, her book, and it starts off with this incredible story of her life that is so jarring, you can't forget it. But you know, ultimately, what this is about, the reason it's so cool we're here together is, is I, this sounds marketing, especially to you guys, but the truth is, like, the story that you described and the story that I describe are things that men and women and work can relate to. And we, we truly are all in this together. If we, we can just get these conversations going, um, and feel free to talk about them because we all want the chance to work well for us and we can all 